So our next speakers are uh, Gary Francione and Anna Charlton, who's unfortunately stranded in beautiful downtown Malvern, Pennsylvania. Uh, hi, Anna. <laughs> and uh, so are we all set up and ready to go on your end? Yes, I believe so. Okay. I can hear you. And so why don't you take it away? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Where's Duncan? You got Duncan? Because Duncan. Now, Duncan is one of our five non-human children. Uh, he was a cruelty case. He was found uh, basically almost dead with his mouth taped shut. Um, if if he didn't have the fur on his face, you would see horrible scarring. He was almost dead. His face was cut in two. It was put back together again. Um, we had six dogs until last week. One of the past four of them were um, cruelty cases. One of the cruelty cases died last week. But this is what people do to uh, non-human animals. And let me tell you, there is nobody on the planet who loves non-human animals, and particularly dogs, more than I do. And if there were two of them left, and it were up to me whether they continue to breed so we could have pets, the answer would be not on your life. I think domestication is really bad, and I'm looking forward to Michael and Sherry's talk today, which I will disagree with probably in every respect. I believe it. <laughs> um, so we'll see. It'll be an animated discussion. Um, Okay, look, uh, let me just say about that. I, I am a, you know, um, for me, veganism is a moral imperative. It's not a lifestyle. It's not a matter of less suffering. It's a matter of fundamental justice. Um, and and um, I, I think, you know, we've got a choice. We're either vegans or we are participating directly in animal exploitation. There ain't no third. There's no, there's no C. There's only A or B. There is no C. There, there's no such thing as compassionate exploitation. There's no such thing as you know exploiting with concern or morally exploiting. Just as there were some slave owners who were better than other slave owners, they were all slave owners, and slavery as an institution was fundamentally wrong. Um, Anna, you did you want to say something about what we were talking about last night about the plate, about having them on your plate? No. We, you have uh, you discussed this idea that um, every sentient being values his or her life, no matter if anybody else does that, what it is, what it means to be, to have inherent value. So really, abolitionist veganism puts before us a simple question of why do we, how do we justify killing other sentient beings who value their lives? Uh, when there's absolutely no reason, no necessity to do so. And abolitionist veganism focuses laser sharp on that question. And uh, some of the practicalities may be interesting and something that needs to be worked out. But the answers, we can keep those simple. One of those veganism is this, this muddied mess of difficult questions and balancing and and all sorts of competing interests, but we're never going to work our way through them because they don't challenge the property status of animals, and therefore they don't challenge our use of animals. And once that animal is on your plate, once it's once you've decided, once you've leapt over the barrier of is it okay for us to use animals in the industries that brought that animal to our plate or onto our backs or for any of the other uses that we, that we use animals, we have begged every significant question that this issue places before us. Given the use, we say, what's a humane way of treating animals? But if once we've conceded the use, we will never, ever find a way to protect, respect, those fundamental values, those moral, the moral worth of other sentient beings with whom we share the planet. And that's, I think, the beauty of an abolitionist view of it. It's clear, it's simple, it's focused, and it has real, tangible, practical, real world solutions. Um, not always simple, but, but no. Um, I think um, vegans are often accused of being ivory tower and, and you know non practical I think it's the, actually the only practical approach that we have um, that's going to to uh, uh, respect 
the values that we say that we have, that we stumble through life giving lip service to these ideas. It's only through an abolitionist vegan perspective that we can actually give respect, practical application of those ideas. You know, when we talk about, when I say um, that if we're not vegans, we are participating directly in animal exploitation, a, a comment I frequently get is, well, you know, you can't, we can't avoid animal exploitation. We can't avoid killing animals because when we grow crops, we kill animals. For example, I hear, if I get, the only thing I ever hear more is, but what about plants? Aren't they sentient? And he says, no, they're not. So let's just put that aside now. They're not. Um, and, um, but, you know, I, I get this, this, this response that, well, you know, we can't avoid participating in animal exploitation. But that's true of all conduct. I mean, we consume products. The products are made by human beings. There are human beings who are incidental, incidentally and unintentionally killed when we, you know, through the manufacture of products. We build a road. You can get an actuarial who will tell you that if you have the, 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 the speed limit is 55, X number of people will die on this road. If it's 65, X number of people will die on that road. So we, we human conduct, all human conduct, incidentally and unintentionally results in some sort of harm. But that doesn't mean that we can't distinguish the situation between building a road where X number of people are going to be killed if it's 55 miles an hour and killing and murdering those people. We draw that distinction. But when animals are concerned, we say, well, you know, you should be a vegan because if you're not a vegan, you're participating directly in animal exploitation, which you might think is fine. But if you have a problem, if you think animals matter morally, there really is no other position than to be vegan. And we can talk about vegetarianism as sort of an incoherent, in my judgment, an incoherent position. But that, that if animals matter morally, if they are not things, then the only position that makes sense is to be vegan. And so the response is, well, but wait a minute now, we're going to kill animals when we grow crops. The answer is, um, we obviously should, should be doing whatever we can to minimize that violence, that unintentional and unintended violence. But the reality is that if we're, if we're eating meat, the number of, you know, we're, we're, in this country alone, in this country alone, we grow enough crops that we feed to animals, we could feed 800 million human beings. So the, the ratios, it depends on the animal and the conditions, but basically between three and 16 pounds of plant protein are required for every pound of animal protein. So the conversion ratio is tremendously inefficient. It's ecologically disastrous. I mean, we're, we're destroying the planet with animal agriculture. We generate more animal agriculture, generates more greenhouse gases than the burning of all fossil fuel for transportation. It's insane. It, animal agriculture is totally irrational, just from, a, from a, uh, an environmental point of view. And even if you don't care about animals, it raises very serious. I mean, if we were all vegans, we could feed the world. It is, it is an animal-based diet, which is, you know, I, I always get a kick when people say, well, isn't veganism elitist? No. What is elitist is an animal as animal agriculture, which not only violates the rights of animals, but basically condemns a substantial portion of the world's population to starvation. It's absolutely, I mean, it, 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 you just can't make sense of it. I want to talk a little bit about what Gary was talking about this morning about the the, the history of this all, and I don't want to dwell too much on this. We can talk about it later if you're interested in it. But what's sort of interesting is. Up until the 19th century, animals were excluded completely from the moral and legal community. They were things. And they were, they were considered either cognitive inferiors, they didn't have reason, they didn't have language, they didn't have, you know, weren't able to use abstract concepts, whatever. Or they were spiritually inferior, they were not made in God's image, you know. And then you have people like, you know, people like Aquinas, for example, who, who basically said, well, you know, they don't have souls because they aren't made in God's image, but they're not rational, so you can sort of mix spiritual inferiority and cognitive inferiority, etc. And then we, and that's basically the, the scene when we come into, in, you know, into the 1800s. And it changes very, very quickly as a result of social reformers, progressives in Britain initially, and then it spread. But, in, you know, you have these social justice reformers who are opposed to slavery, and they're concerned about child labor, and they're concerned about suffrage, and stuff like that. And then they sort of turn into animals. And you get people like Bentham who say that, well, um, yeah, they're cognitively different from us, 
But that doesn't matter insofar as their interests in not suffering are concerned. That is, yeah, they may not be able to think the way we think. They may be cognitive inferiors, but that doesn't mean that they don't suffer. And as long as they suffer, they matter more. Or less. Well, you know, you can think, well, what the hell? I mean, that's not too that's not too terribly much. The answer is it changed think our thinking. It basically brought animals into the moral community because what Bentham did was he sort of asked a simple question: What difference does it matter as long as they can suffer? That was asked fairly, you know, fairly early in the 18th century. By the mid, uh, by the 19th century, by the mid 19th century, we started to get these animal welfare laws. By the time 20th century comes around, we've got them all over the place. They didn't exist a couple hundred years ago. Indeed, you know, people, in, in, you know, the 1600s, 1700s would have thought it would be crazy to have such 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 uh, uh, laws or, or moral ideas. But Bentham believed, he continued to believe that they were cognitively inferior and that they weren't self-aware. So the cow didn't care that we killed and ate her. She only cared about how we raised her and how we slaughtered her. And that's where you get this idea that, well, it's okay for us to continue to use animals as long as we take their interest in not suffering seriously. And that is an impossible thing to do because animals are property. They have no inherent or in, you know, they have no inherent value or no intrinsic value. They only have economic value. You see? So basically it's also important to, to remember Gary as we, as you're talking, is that's the world that we live in. That's Bentham, Peter Singer, and that's, that's right. all, you know, higher compassion and um, right. welfare standards. That is the framework that the abolitionist approach to this question really needs to confront. Yeah, and, and, and that's, you know, it's, I was talking to Gary, and we were talking last night at dinner, you know, and the, I started doing this, you know, in, in the early 1980s, uh, when Anna and I got involved with, um, with some folks, and we started talking about animal rights, and then I, I met Tom Reagan, and, and, and we spent many nights um, talking about uh, many nights, we stayed up all night, literally talking about how does the difference between rights and welfare turn it, you know, translate into abolitionist strategy, into strategy, into, into actual activist strategy. And, you know, it was toward the end, of, and, and, and there were other things going on. You know, PETA was going into a very sexist direction, and we believed that, you know, there had to be a really strong human rights connection, and blah, blah, blah. And so we developed this idea that, you know, that rights meant you can't use them at all. And that's what rights meant. And what we have right now is a welfare movement, including, I mean, all of the groups, PETA, Mercy for Animals, and all of these groups are basically what I call happy exploitation organizations. They're not only, in my judgment, not moving the ball forward, they're pushing it backward because they're promoting and perpetuating the idea, which is wrong, that there's a compassionate way to exploit. There ain't no compassionate way to exploit, just as there's no compassionate way to be a slave owner. You're either a slave owner or you weren't a slave owner. Some slave owners were nicer, in some sense, than others. You know, we're always told, well, George Washington was such a good slave owner. He didn't rape his slaves. Like, that's what's just, what a great guy George was. Um, and, and, I mean, assuming that that's true, I have no idea whether he raped or didn't rape his slaves, but let's assume he didn't. He was still a slave owner, okay? Um, I went to the University of Virginia where if you ever criticize Thomas Jefferson, who owned slaves and did not, by the way, um, uh, uh, emancipate them when he died. They were sold to pay the debts of, of, of his estate. But I mean, you know, I went there for graduate school, I went there for law school, and if you ever said anything bad about Thomas Jefferson, you could easily be killed. But, um, you know, because he was supposed to be an enlightened, progressive slave owner. Nonsense. He was a slave owner. You know, there are slave owners and there are opponents of slavery. And, you know, the idea that we ought to be promoting you know, some some humane form of slavery or some enlightened form of slavery. We would, I mean, nobody would do that now. I, I often ask my my friends, my animal friends, who promote these these uh, welfare things, you know, like Meatless Monday. I said, well, look, you know, racism is a really serious problem. It is. I mean, you know, I mean, you can say, well, you know, we're, we've made a lot of progress. Yeah, we don't have slavery, but we've got racism is every you know, racism is a very serious problem. And, and a very serious one. So let's say, why don't we have compassionate racist? Let's have racist joke free Monday. You know, I mean, would anybody ever promote, no one would promote such a thing. They would regard it, you know, or you know, rape. I mean, you know, in this country, one out of four women gets, gets to age 22 has either been a victim of rape or attempted rape. So you, you, there are rape laws, but they're, they're a joke. I mean, rape is a major, major, major problem. 
So let's have rape free Monday or let's have misogyny free Monday. Nobody would promote such a thing. But where animals are concerned, we talk about meat free Monday, we talk about, you know, uh, January, we talk about all of these things, which I think are really quite speciesist. We need to be clear. We need to be clear that there's veganism and there's animal exploitation. There is no third position. And 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 so, you know, and, and I don't think that that's a radical position. I think it actually makes quite a bit of sense. And and let me dovetail into and do you, before we talk about rice, do you want to mention anything? Uh, that that way of looking at things. I understand that we're at a certain point in history where we have a long tradition and a, and a habituation to having animal products on our plate on our plates and on our backs. Um, but those are things of, of sort of moderating our use, of drawing back a little bit from our use. Abolitionist veganism asks that very direct question: How do we justify our use of animal? What possible justification is there? For, for um, violating every every um, interest of, a, of another sentient being and killing them and then, and then they're ending up on our plates or otherwise being used for us. So that's the question, that's the core question that abolitionist veganism asks. And and that's, I think, where we get to the crux of it and that's where we require a response in these debates. And it's a, it's a way not to get lost um, in these discussions because often your interlocutor and suddenly walked a passage to that desert island where there's no vegetation but there's a, a scrumptious looking rabbit. Or they suddenly understood what carrots might be saying when, you, when they scrape it before that the ground. So it's so easy to get lost in these, um, in, in these distractions, these, these odd, bizarre attempts at justification when the, the simple answer of how we justify killing another sentient being who values his or her life um, only only puts before us the answer of abolitionist veganism. I think that's very important for our discussions in an academic setting and hypnosis in real life settings outside there. And, and, and you know, it's not a matter of whether um, they're rational or whether they have the ability. I mean, I don't. I, I mean, I live with five as of last week, six, but now five um, uh, animals, five dogs. And I have no doubt they think. I don't know how they think because my thinking and your thinking is connected with concepts and, you know, words and language. And, you know, the relationship of our thinking to language is, is you know, what it is. And, um, and they don't have symbolic communication. So I don't know how they think, but they clearly do think. But as far as I'm concerned, rationality, abstract, you know, ability to think, abstract, I don't really care about it, as long as they're central. That is, are they subjectively aware? If they're subjectively aware, they have an interest in continuing to live. Because it would be absurd to say that a sentient being does not have an interest in continuing to live, because sentience is only a means to the end of continued existence. So to ask the question, well, does a sentient being have an interest in continuing to live, um, is like asking, does a being who have eyes has an interest, have an interest in continuing to see? Of course they do. I mean, so to say that a being is, is sentient is to say that the being has an interest in continuing to live. Now, do I think that they are the same as us? The answer is, I don't even know what all that question means, but the answer is probably not. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I really don't know, but what difference does it make? There's only one question. Can I morally justify using them exclusively as resources and as means to my end? And as far as I'm concerned, all sentient beings are equal. For the purpose, it doesn't mean they're all the same. It means they're all equal for the purpose of having the moral right not to be used exclusively as a resource. And the problem with property, and the reason why animal welfare reform can't work, is because animals are property, it costs money to protect their interests, right? So, you know, you go to the farmer, you say, you know, we don't like the way that you're raising the pigs. So we want you to protect more of their interests. Well, it costs money to protect more of their interests. They will protect the interests that they need to protect in order to explicitly, efficiently exploit the animals. Okay, that's the level, that, the level of animal welfare. The first book I wrote a million and a half years ago was about was basically looking at animal welfare law in Britain and America for the past two hundred years. And what I concluded was was that the standard of animal welfare protection was basically linked to what you had to do, what interests you had to protect in order to exploit an animal in an economically efficient way. I mean, for example, you look at the Humane Slaughter Act, which was passed in 1958 in this country. Why did it pay? I mean, animals have all sorts of interests. Why did they decide that large animals had to be stunned before they were shackled, hoisted, and cut unless it was kashrut or halal? And the answer was 
because if you have a 2,000 pound animal hanging upside down by you know by one leg, pelvis breaks, they're in a lot of pain, they're freaking out. I don't know if you've ever been in a slaughterhouse, but they freak out and they move around a lot and they hit workers and they cause they incur carcass damage. So you have a law which requires that they be stunned so that they ain't moving around a lot. They're not they're not injuring workers and 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 they're not incurring carcass damage. Which is why, by the way, Chickens weren't included in the Humane Slaughter Act because people thought, well, I thought chickens are small, you know, they're not, there's no big deal. And now if you look at the campaigns that groups like PETA and the Humane Society of the United States, etc., and Mercy Friends are promoting for asphyxiation of chickens and getting them, you know, is basically they're, out, they're saying, look, the way we're killing chickens is economically inefficient. We would reduce, there's a lot of carcass damage. And, 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 and we would reduce that carcass damage if we asphyxiated the animals, which is true. If you all were going to start a chicken processing plant right now, you didn't have one that you were already you know, committed to because you had money, capital involved, that you were, you were expensing over a you know, tax life. If you were starting today, you would be crazy not to use an, an, a gassing method of processing the poultry because... There's a lot less carcass damage, and there are fewer worker injuries because the present system of killing chickens involves electricity and knives and all sorts of stuff, and people do get injured. Um, and there's a huge amount of carcass damage. And there have been all sorts of studies showing that that you know large chicken producers will get a lot of economic benefit from going to asphyxiation, which is what they're all doing. As, as, the, as the equipment that they have now gets older, they get the tax advantages, and they, they, they expense it out, and then they have to reinvest capital. They will reinvest capital in a more economically efficient way. This has nothing to do with animal welfare. This has, this has to do with business. So what you've got right now is this really, really unholy alliance between the animal welfare groups, including PETA, Mercy for Animals, you know, Indica, all of these groups. And basically what they're doing is working with industry, promoting happy exploitation, okay? Which is, they become an adjunct to industry. And then when you try to ask them, when you say, well, what, do you, what's, what about veganism? They say, oh, we're all for veganism. We're all for veganism as a way of reducing suffering. You know, and so cage-free eggs, crate-free pork, Veganism, sure, whatever you want to do, there is no right or wrong answer. It's just animals matter more, and we aren't engaged in just massive mental masturbation. Then there has to be some sort of moral truth here. And if animals matter morally, we simply cannot justify continued animal exploitation. We simply can't. And so veganism is the only morally, morally rational response to the recognition that animals matter more. I mean, you may think that animals are things, and you may have a Cartesian view of animals, which is, you know, you can do it. Um, but if you don't have that position, if you do believe that they matter morally, um, animals are, you know, that veganism is the only morally uh, rational response. I want to talk just a second about rights. You say, ah, animal rights, what does that mean? How do animals have rights? A right is a simple concept. It's a way of protecting an interest. There are two ways of protecting an, an interest. What's an interest? Preference, desire, want. We all have interests. Some of the interests are the same. You know, some of our interests are the same. We share with each other. Some of us depend, you know, you may have an interest in playing golf. I'd rather be dead than play golf. I mean, you know, it, it, it's, 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 it's um, you know, people have different interests, okay? And, and, um, and there are different ways of protecting interests. You can protect the interest irrespective of consequences. Or you can respect the, the, the interest that, depending on consequences. So if I, to say that I have a right of free speech, is simply that my interest in my expression will be protected, even if the consequences of protecting it, even if it makes, you know, even if what I say makes all of you unhappy, my, my speech will still be protected. My speech isn't absolutely protected. I can't yell fire in a crowded movie theater. I can't engage in defamation because that's false speech. It's not putting any ideas into the marketplace of ideas. So, you know, it, it's not absolute protection, but it's basically my interest in expression will be protected irrespective of consequences. Okay, um, you know, I have a right of liberty. I have an interest in doing what, you know, in, in moving about freely and not being confined. That's not an absolute right, okay? If I do something, if I commit a crime and I'm found by a jury of my peers to be uh, guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, then my, li I, my, I, my liberty will 
will be taken away from me. But we can't just say, well, I mean, this one, one of the reasons why many of us think Guantanamo Bay is a very bad idea is because we've got people who haven't been convicted of a crime, and we're just confining them because consequentially it makes us feel better. Okay? And, and many of us say, that's not right. You can't, you, you, as a moral matter, put aside the law, as a moral matter, you should not deprive these people of their liberty for these consequential reasons. If you want to deprive them of their liberty, then you should show beyond a reasonable doubt that they've done something wrong. And if you can't do that, you shouldn't deprive them of their liberty simply because they are people who scare us. And so, consequentially, we feel better when they are confined in cages because they scare us. But, so that's all the right is, is a way of protecting an interest. And what, what, you know, when, when I was sort of developing this stuff, you know, 30 years ago, the abolitionist approach, and was basically the idea that every sentient being has the moral right, i.e. the interest in not being treated as a thing, has to be protected irrespective of consequences, because if that's not the case, then there will be, you know, the, 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 then, then the consequences, particularly given um, the fact that they are property, their interests will always be undervalued. I mean, what's interesting is Bentham was a utilitarian, but he opposed slavery. Now, why did he oppose slavery? The standard answer is that he opposed slavery because um, uh, he opposed slavery because it wasn't it wouldn't it wouldn't maximize overall social welfare. That if people were working for their own benefit, there would be greater social you know social wealth and, and, and social welfare would be higher because because people working for their own benefit will will work harder and more creatively than people who are working as slaves. That is, Bentham definitely did say stuff like that. But he also talked about Bentham was a utilitarian, never talked about more rights, except when he talked about the right not to be a slave. I believe that Bentham understood that if you have a slave and you have a slave owner, the slave's interests are always going to be systematically undervalued. So when there's a conflict, the slave owner is always going to win because that's what the institution of slavery is. And the principle of equal consideration can never be applied to a, to a human who is a slave because that human's interest Excuse me. Will always be values us. You know, everyone to count for one. No one to count for more than one. That's what Bentham said. Bentham, I believe, understood that if you have slavery, the slaves' interests always count for less than one. That's what slavery is. What Bentham didn't understand was that's exactly what happens with animal property. You have animals. You have animal property. Animal owners. Animal. Animal property is always going to lose. It is what is inherent in the institution of property. So I maintain that all sentient beings have one moral right, the right not to be property, which means we cannot treat them exclusively as means to our ends, which means institutionalized exploitation has to go. It has to, it, there is no moral basis for it. Anna, do you have... Uh, and so as you were speaking, I was remembering the... Um, the those fa fascinating slave cases yeah. um, um, where there were attempts um, for whatever historical ac accident brought slave interests before a tribunal. And you have the judge saying, we cannot have an appeal to vindicate slave interests against the owner of the property's interest, or else the institution of property would not exist in that in that uh, situation. So it, it, it's, we, we, we brought all these animals into existence for uses that we've said are okay, however trivial. And we'll probably have a moment to talk about what necess necessity means and what unnecessar unnecessary suffering is and what conflict is in these discussions. But we brought them into existence for a use the property is going to be used in this way, and then welfareism and welfareism vegan uh, approaches fret and worry about how we should treat them. It's completely incoherent. The property doesn't have rights against the interest of the property owner, else they're not, it's not property. So we are stuck in this contradictory, swirling. 
um, you know, lack of analysis. Um, we need to be absolute focus on um, on an abolitionist approach to this, so that the use is is what uh, in our spotlight um, and to say if our proposed use violates the uh, inherent uh, value of um, the rights of other set of beings. That's what gives us clarity. And you know, what's sort of interesting about all this is it's, what is our conventional wisdom about animals? Our conventional wisdom about animals is that we think it's wrong to inflict unnecessary suffering on animals. I mean, would anybody, I mean, does anybody really disagree with that? I mean, I, I, I've been doing this. Well, we, we try this literally practically. Right? Yeah. If, that, if you could go out of class, you could go ask people on the street, yes, we've done it, uh, with students, and you'll get different views on almost every um, other moral question that's swirling around on capital punishment or abortion. Uh, gay rights in some situations, there'll be, uh, you know, uh, different views on it. But if you ask somebody, how do you feel about inflicting unnecessary suffering on animals, animals people recoil, oh no, of course not. No, but that's at the same time we've got 110 billion uh, land animals being killed every year, probably, for people and so many um, other sea animals as we heard before. Um, those two ideas don't go together. So we need to work out what we mean by unnecessary uh, conflict and uh, the justifications for use. I mean, it, you know, whatever necessity means, it's got to exclude imposing suffering or death for reasons of pleasure, or amusement, or convenience, right? I mean, because if, if it doesn't exclude that, then you don't have a principle against unnecessary suffering. And but yet, if you look, 99.9999999 percent of the use of animals that we make. It is only for pleasure, amusement, or convenience. I mean, the main the main thing being you know, for the, the the primary use of animals is for food. I mean, there are, there are other uses, but those other uses are numerically small compared to sixty billion land animals and a trillion sea animals a year. I mean, the estimates on sea animals is 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 you know there are different estimates. The lowest one out there is a trillion. A trillion is a million million. That's a lot of animals, right? And so even if you say, well, you know, what about the clams and the Oysters, they may not be sentient. I don't know whether they are. I don't eat them. But, um, but you know, even excluding them, you're still talking. You know, you're still talking, um, you know, I mean, a, tr a little bit, a, a little fewer less than a trillion. I mean, but that's still an enormously high number. And, and so, you know, that's the biggest number of animals that we exploit. We have no, there is no necessity or compulsion. The only reason why we eat them is because they taste good. And I remember some years ago when Mike Vick, Michael Vick, um, and he, Michael Vick for me is the gift that keeps on giving. Because whenever I'm giving a, a talk, you know, I start off and I ask, I, you know, I'm talking at a college and I say, how many of y'all know my, Michael Vick? Every kid raises his or her hand. You know, yeah, Michael Vick, bad guy. Yeah, bad guy. Why is he a bad guy? No, he killed those dogs. Well, but, you know, so what? I mean, he enjoyed, he enjoyed what he did. Well, but that's not right. Why isn't it right? Well, you shouldn't kill dogs because you get some sort of pleasure out of it. Okay, how many of y'all are vegans? And then 300 kids, there's three cans go up. I say, you have to explain to me. The rest of y'all have to explain to me what's going on with the other 397 of you who aren't vegan. Because what's the difference? How are you any different from Michael Vick? Actually, I wrote an essay some years ago. It was published. Uh, I don't remember. It was the Philadelphia Inquirer, Philadelphia Daily News. I forgot okay. which. It was Daily News. Called Merrill and Michael Vick, basically arguing, you know, What's, you know, what's the difference between us and Michael Vick? And I got such an incredible, I, I mean, I, I do that all the time. I was talking last night about, it. you know, there was a kid in Brooklyn, Andre Robinson. And he kicked a cat. He didn't kill the cat. He kicked the cat. He shouldn't have done it. It was wrong. And so I was on CNN. And the guy said, should we put this kid in jail? And I said, well, 6 o'clock at night. I said, there are a lot of people who are sitting there eating their hamburgers, ice cream, eggs, whatever. And they're sitting there saying, put that son of a bitch in jail. What about the rest of the people who are sitting there eating the animals? I mean, the kid didn't kill the cat. I'm not saying he should have killed the cat. What he did was wrong. What he did was wrong. But how, how are they any different? Sitting there eating their hamburger saying, put that kid in jail. And I said, you know, you're going to put the kid in jail. You've got to put everybody else in jail. 
Now, I will tell you, when I say these sorts of things, um, you know, write these sorts of things about Michael, people get very upset with me. Now, you know, I mean, some people say it's very provocative, and I never thought about it that way. Other people wish death on me, and they get very, very upset. I'm not really sure why, but it's, it's really quite clear to me that um, there's, you know, I mean, 99% of what we do is, we, we, the reasons are transparently frivolous. We don't need to eat them. We don't need to wear them. I've been a vegan for 36 years. I ain't dead yet. You know, I sleep four hours a night. I can't remember the last time I got sick. And I got more energy than the kids I teach who are now becoming, like, grandchildren age. But, um, but you know, uh, you, know I mean, you don't need, we don't need to eat them. You know, I mean, I, I'm not going to make the argument. I don't think I need to make the argument that we're going to be more healthy. If we're if we're eating plants, although I think the empirical data are pretty clear, we're well, saying we'll be less healthy. I mean, you know, you, you know, people say, "Well, you know, is being a vegan healthy?" I say, "Well, wait a minute now. You're somebody who eats decomposing flesh, cow mucus, and chicken oil, but you're asking me whether or not my diet is healthy. Think about that for a second. You know, what I mean, think about how like what a screwed up question that really is. You know, what I mean, and and so um, so I think you know, in in many ways. You know, you see, we see it time after time after time, where when we when people focus on individual animals, and it's not just the animals we fetishize, the dogs and the cats. It's like you know, people get excited when a cow escapes from a slaughterhouse, or you know, or people like you know, people will will get all upset about a deer who has been you know injured and is is at risk of dying or something, and people will go to great lengths to sit. We understand that these are individuals. We understand that that they are sentient beings, and we understand that imposing unnecessary suffering is wrong. But I, and I think part of the problem, you know, and I think about this all the time. Too, I think it's very, you know, I, I think about very little else. But um, but but um, I, you know, why is it that we continue to eat them? Why is it that there's such a resistance? That. And I think part of it is really quite simple. I think I think media. I think we have been we have really been sold the bill of goods. Um, I mean, I remember, and it wasn't that long. It was thirty six years ago I became a vegan, but it's not that long ago. And I remember doctors at you know like at you know I was living in Manhattan. I was you know I was going to you know high high you know these you know supposedly very sophisticated physicians, and they were telling me, oh, you, you can't live that way. You, you know, you're, you're going to get sick. You know, and these are like, these are people who've been through medical school, and they're telling me, I'm going to get sick. Um, you know, and, and, you know, my father, my mother, my brother died. They all had high cholesterol. They all had heart problems. I got low cholesterol. got no heart problems. and can't remember the last time I took a pill. So, um, so you know, it, this idea that, you know, I mean, I, I think most of us still think that if we don't, I think, you know, I meet a lot of guys who say, well, you know, but if you don't eat meat, you know, won't you be less virile? I say, well, gee, you know, I don't know, but I can tell you, you're going to increase your chances of prostate cancer, which is going to really mess things up for you, isn't it? Mm-hmm. But, um, but, you know, but this, this idea that, that, you know, that we need to be, I mean, the number of women who say, if I don't eat animal products, I'll get osteoporosis. No, the more animal products you get, the more animal products you eat, the more your blood acidifies. In order to try to alkalinize, your blood will leach calcium from your bones. I know tons of vegan women. None of them have osteoporosis. None of them. And so, you know, but we buy into this stuff that we don't eat these products, we're going to get sick, we're going to die, we're going to be weak, we're not going to be manly or whatever the hell, you know, I mean, these crazy ideas. And so I, but, and I think, so I think we need better education in that respect. But the bottom line is, this is really, I mean, there's only one use of animal we make that is not transparently frivolous, and that's the use of animals to cure serious human illnesses. Now, I'm opposed to that. I do not believe in any sort of vivisection. But that's at least, that's, that, that, you know, you at least got something to talk about there, you know, and, 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 um, you know, I mean, you at least have something to talk about there. Now, I don't think we should do it for the same reason that I don't, I mean, I, I, I do not believe that there is any, quote, defect that animals have that make it okay for us to use them in vivisection where that defect is not shared by some group of humans that we would never use for that purpose. And so we end up doing it simply because we're human and they're not, which is like saying we're black and they're we're white and they're not, or we're straight and they're not, or whatever. You know, it, 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 it's just discrimination. It's prejudice. But that's the only thing that really requires something more complex than Saying to somebody, do you think it's wrong to inflict unnecessary suffering on animals? And everybody says, yes. Well, why the hell, you know, why are you eating them? Why are you wearing them? You don't need to do that. 
Just you have choices, you know. You, there's no compulsion. There's no necessity. When you when you go when you decide what you're going to eat today, there ain't no fight between. There's no conflict between you and the cow, or you and the chicken, or you and the fish. It's your something. It's your palate preference. That's all it is. And and so so you know I, I think we need to think more clearly. I mean I think we suffer from what I call moral schizophrenia. I mean and, and I really mean it's like delusional thinking, literally morally delusional thinking. Anna. Anything before we go? Uh, also, the last point you brought up was um, kind of follows on also from what Gary uh, Steiner was saying about you know burning houses and who we would choose. And you always made the point that if if Gary ran into his burning house and saved Paula, um, it doesn't mean if uh, in a situation of true conflict and we can respect that choice. Doesn't mean that that he's not in that situation. He starts farming cats. So he might have made the decision in that conflict to, give, to prefer um, recognizing human interests doesn't mean that he goes afterwards in situations of non-compulsion, non-conflict, non-emergency, and continues to violate the fundamental rights of other sentient beings by industrial use of, of animals, food, clothing, and all the other reasons that we do it. So we can look at the difficulties that some of these emergency situations pose, but it certainly doesn't then justify our day-to-day -day relentless uh, choices uh, to violate their fundamental rights that find such the basis for them. Yeah, I mean, if I'm all going about a burning house, and I see that there's an old person there, and there's a, a young right. person, and I say, so, well, you know, I can't, I'd like to say both of them, but I can't. I can't right. save both of them, and I'm going to save the younger person because the older person has lived his or her life, and the younger person hasn't. So I'm going to, I mean, I you know, I can't do what I want to do, which is save both. So I'm going to save the younger person. That doesn't mean it's all right to like use old people in circuses, zoos, or rodeos, or use them in vivisection or anything like that, which is the the conclusion that we draw. And and I think that that's 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 just wrong. Um, do you, Gary, can we go? Q and A for about fifteen minutes and wrap up. Yeah, I wanted to talk about moral realism, but I'm not going to get to moral realism. We will have time this afternoon for that. You say that now, <laughs> uh, but that's what people always say at these conferences. Don't worry, you can get to it later. Um, yeah, let's go to let's go to question. Let's go to question. Okay, I'll start with one. Can yeah. you elaborate a little for people who might not already be in tune with this about how it is that the vegan imperative extends to dairy and eggs? Oh yeah, yeah. there is no. I uh, thank you. Um, there is no morally coherent distinction between meat and other animal products. Animals used for dairy, um, you know, are treated every bit as badly as animals. I mean, you know, cows are kept pregnant. Um, you know, they're they're kept pregnant constantly. Their you know their babies are taken away from them because that's how it's done. Um, you know, they take the baby away from them. They get pregnant again. They have another baby. You know, they keep giving them milk. Blah 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 blah. And you know, it's a hard. I mean, I, I actually. If, if there were a steak in front of me and a glass of milk, and you put a gun to my head and said, you've got to consume one of them, I would like to say, I would not consume either of them, blow my brains out. But I'd probably get terrified. And, 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 <laughs> and if, I, but if I were making the decision just on suffering and injustice, vile, ranked injustice, I, I would probably eat the meat before I would drink. I mean, milk is hard. Milk is just truly horrible. I mean, involved, and, and I don't understand my feminist friends. Who like aren't vegans? I mean, it's a complete commodification of of that cow's reproductive process. A complete commodification of her relationship to her baby. It is vile. It is horrible. And as I've seen a lot of stuff in my life that I wish I hadn't seen. But but um, dairy farms are some of the worst stuff out there. You know, I mean, it's just it's a continual. It's a continual heartbreaking situation because if you've ever seen how cows behave when those calves are taken away and you have a question in your mind as to whether or not those mothers are suffering, then my suggestion to you is that you move, remove your head from wherever it is where the sun is not shining because you aren't paying attention to what you are seeing. Um, and, and, um, so, you know. And, and if those obviously end up in small house, same small house anyway. Yeah, they will kill them anyway. That's the retirement and of old age. So, the fact that you are extracting a commodity during the process of a whole lifetime of use does not absolve you from responsibility for all the bad things that happen to that animal. Yeah, and, and also remember, half the animals, boys, are, are sold for veal. So they're killed. I mean, they're, you know, they're killed in six months. Um, and and the females are all recycled in the dairy industry. 
eggs. Oh God! I mean, I don't understand like, any. I mean, putting aside like you know what it is and, and, and the, the inherent grossness of eating eating it. Um, the uh, eggs are really quite vile, and I don't really care. It's cage free, free range. That that is. I, the, the the proper legal word is bullshit, um, and 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 I apologize to, to bulls for using it. But to, to talk about cage free, free range, as as these are some, some sort of compassionate choices, it's nonsense. It's complete nonsense. So there is, I mean, when people say to me I'm a vegetarian, I would say why, and they say, what do you mean why? Is that good? And I say, well, you know, it depends what you mean by good. I mean, that's when people say to me I'm a vegetarian, I always sort of think. That's like somebody saying to me, I eat meat from a small cow, but I won't eat meat from a larger cow. We would all sort of say, well, that's sort of a screwy position. Hey, what's, why, you know, I mean, why draw a line between meat and other animal products? They're all the same. They all involve in torture. They all involve, the thing is, the most compassionately produced animal products you can buy, if you go to Whole Foods and, and you buy, you know, level five, I mean, I, I actually find it, I find it. Deeply disturbing that we have that you can go to Whole Foods and you can choose your level of torture one two three four five and you have Peter Singer and PETA and all of these groups saying this is great this is terrific promoting this stuff the most humanely raised humanely I hate that word the most humanely raised animal products you can eat you can buy are produced if humans were involved it would be torture it, there is no such thing as humane exploitation there ain't no such thing. Other questions? Yeah, Levi, Levi, you're Levi, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, if we institutionalized worldwide socialism and eliminated its private property, would that by default free all animals from? And you want you want you think like animal you think animal rights is unrealistic? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know that, that's a, that's a good question. Um, the problem with that is animals have been property in every socioeconomic system. Tribals. I mean, you know, they've basically been resources. Whether we're talking about socialist systems, capitalist systems, tribal systems, more anarch anarchistic systems, and in certain ways, um, the our treatment of animals as property sort of presents a problem for Marx's view that morality was determined by the economic substructure, because it seems to me that animals have been have been fatified or commodified in every single economic and social system. So I, I, I don't think that world socialism, I mean, democratic socialism would have very good, and, and I, as far as humans are concerned, yes, it would be, it would be much better. And, and, and as far as our politics are concerned, because if you had democratic socialism, speech would be less controlled by corporations and things like that. So I mean, there would be a lot of benefits. I don't think there would be necessarily, there would necessarily be benefits for non-humans. Because you're assuming that the moral issue of the status of animals would be determined by the economic arrangement. And the answer is, I don't think that that's true, and I don't think there's any proof for that. But it's a great question. I mean, I, it comes up. From, you know, I mean, it comes up. We had a conference at Rutgers a few years ago, and David Nyberg. Um, I don't know if you know him, but he was there, and he was making that argument. And and you know, we had, an, we had a very interesting discussion about about it because I think he's wrong. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, mentioned beginning that some people consider veganism like an ivory tower, right? yeah, like elitist thing. How do you deal with certain people, like, like for example, the Inuit people, who live in a climate they really can't grow anything? You're smiling already. Let me finish my question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm an Inuit. You didn't know that. I'm only kidding on that. So they live in a climate that their diet is 100 percent meat. They even have genetic adaptations that are able to process all this meat. Their livers are very large, and so forth. How do you deal with situations like that? And they're not the only people out here who have living clients where they have to eat insects or what have you. Um, well, I think that, um, you know, uh, it, you'd be surprised how much stuff is flown in to those places. Um, and so it's not that they're just sort of sitting around eating whale blubber or whatever. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's m much more complicated than that. There's quite a bit of, of bringing in of foods. Um, but let me ask you, I think you have, you know, you, one of the first talks I ever gave, probably 1984, I was in Toronto and there was a, I was asked to come speak about the, some revision of the Canadian anti-cruelty, of uh, the Ontario anti-cruelty law. And, and 
And I was talking about vegans. We've been talking about this for a long time. And so I, was ta- I, met- I get into veganism. I was talking, they were talking about law, but I mentioned being vegan and stuff. And a guy came up to the microphone, and he was an interview. And he said, um, how do you justify? He said, he, he said I, you think all animal killing is wrong? And I said, yeah, I don't think it's more than justifiable. And he said, how can you as an outsider make a statement about the morality of what my people do? And he explained he was doing it. And I said, let me ask you a question. I said, if your people were doing child sacrifice, human child sacrifice, would it be okay for me as an outsider to comment on that, to criticize it? And he said, of course. I said, and we both agree that outsiders can criticize what you do and that you're not really um, a moral relativist in that sense. We just disagree about the basic question, which is what, you know, you think animal concerns don't trigger it. I do. We both agree human concerns would trigger it. So we're just sort of in a battle about speciesism. And, and then I ended up talking with the guy for quite a bit afterward. And, and um, you know, and I, I mean, look, um, I don't think it's right. What, you know, just like I don't know, people say, well, you know, in Namibia, you know, they take cows and they, they eat, the, you know, they take pieces off the cow and they eat them and they sort of keep the cow, you know, but this is their culture. And the answer is, you know what? Everything bad is part of somebody's culture with misogyny and patriarchy being sort of the primary examples of like, of like, Features of every civilization that we know of, and yes, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's it's I'm not that sorry to interrupt. I said that. No, she's not. <laughs> <laughs> she's I've been asked that question by an Inuit. I have never been asked that question by an Inuit, but I've been asked that question a lot. And I think it's one of these examples, not the person who's presently asking it, of, of, of you know, asking it short. It's a, it's a, there's another distraction. From the decisions that most of us make, who are not in the wits and are actually going down to their local Acme or other supermarket and, and pulling that refrigerated door section and bringing, um, you know, an animal that they didn't have any conflict with home to put on their plates. But these questions are arising. I mean, there are parts of the world now that are becoming certified, and so you can't embrace the sort of vegetable crops that you have. I don't think anyone's presuming, uh, proposing that they should then be able to go and kill your neighbor to, to uh, compensate for the protein deficiency that they're not getting from agricultural crops, which are no longer thriving in that, in, in that environment. And there was one really interesting case, I think, that came up within the last decade. I have to go and look it up. But in the Pitch Caroline, Car- Car- yes. probably people will remember um, uh, the, the descendants of the mutiny of the bounty who uh, decided to stay there to avoid prosecution and, and uh, 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 married into the, the existing population. And, you know, half, half of the population is, is, is a Christian. And um, there, was, there was a scandal because um, a, a large number of the males on the island, and they are a long way from anywhere, and they are pretty vulnerable in terms of being subject to, you know, Changes in, in uh, being able to get resources to them. They were accused of um, sexual violence, rape, and all sorts of sexual assault. And the question was if you put that number of males if, through the legal system and then incarcerate them, then there will not be enough males to go and get the resources for the people on the island to continue to live there. Now, what's that? That's that sort of crisis situation that's very similar to the Inuit question, isn't it? Are you going to permit people to violate the fundamental rights of other sentient beings, the members of their own community in that case, um, in order to let them continue to live there? So there are hard questions. Yeah, in most, not, no, in, in, in real life. And most people have a, don't have a problem saying we shouldn't be violating the rights of humans. In those sorts of situations, but then they say, "Well, but what about animals?" And the thing is, we are really talking about what we're really talking about is speciesism. We aren't really talking about the moral question because we would answer the moral question in a particular way. Um, uh, we're humans involved. We just okay. don't. Okay, just ideas of consequences. I'm trying to work these things out in my mind so I can come to you know resolution. I mean, I talk to go vegan. Stuff. That's the only conclusion. <laughs> but, but in terms of, I'm just concerned about, and we as a culture have done this. 
over the centuries, moral imperialism, where we, we have a great idea and we just want to change other cultures for that. I'm just trying to. Work. I'm really not interested. You know, it, it, I'm not. I'm really not interested in invading other countries and making them go vegan. I, I'm worried about my own. Um, <laughs> right now, I, I mean, it's, a, it's not really a matter of moral imperialism because I, I can't. I, I, if if I add up the time I've been doing this almost for you know I like thirty you know, almost forty years. Um, if I add up the time I've been doing this, in which I've been focused on um, invading other countries to cause them to go vegan, the answer is, um, you know, I, I don't. The only time I ever talk about Inuits is when people ask me those sorts of questions. I mean, I, you know, and it's like it's like seeing I thought I don't believe we should be using animals to service animals. I don't really spend. I mean, it's like it's like, but come on. I mean, you know, we're 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 ever going to see the problem with using service animals. As long as we're eating animals, we ain't never going to get. So I don't talk about it. I mean, I, I focus on I focus on eating them, wearing them, using them. And if we were to exclude all of those things, and I believe, you know, I mean, it's not that I'm insensitive to people who eat service animals. I just don't think we should be using animals in that way. And I think we should be allocating resources to people who have who have sight deprivation or other things, so that they can lead full lives. And there's all there are all sorts of things we can do to make their lives easier. But we, you know, we spend most, you know, we spend way too much money on building things to kill other people, and we don't allocate enough resources to those sorts of people. And then we say, okay, get a dog. And you know, the answer is that's not the answer in my my view. Yeah, yeah. We, should, we should stop after this last question. Okay. Okay. Yes. I'm gonna try to shoot. Maybe we'll try to stop. Moral realism. This is fascinating to me because in your you know what he's saying, saying to me, and he won't let me do it. Blame him. Blame him. Well, you say my question. Okay. So in your books, you take a constructivist view. You know, appeal to people, for those of you who are philosophy, to people with a with a set of shared values. Yeah. And so, are you taking a different kind of ethical view? Well, I'm not. I, mean, I mean, yeah, I, I am a moral realist. Um, and I, I sort of agree with Chomsky that everybody's a moral realist. The only people who aren't moral realists are people in philosophy departments who are sort of sitting around saying, well, you know, it's really moral reality because everybody, I mean, I think Chomsky's right there, but, but I would say this. I believe the statement that it is wrong to inflict suffering without a justification is something that everybody accepts is true, whether it's a moral intuition or whether it's the basis of kinship or whether it is a fundamental, I mean, so why I disagree with Schaefer Landau and those people is I, Jacob Landau and uh, many other moral realists would say that there would be moral truths even if human beings didn't exist. I don't believe that. I, I don't even because moral moral morality is about um, how people how, how how beings who can make choices ought to behave. So if there are no beings, then what the hell? We, I mean, it's like you know, well, there's, there's a truth, you know. Um, and so I don't believe that. But it seems to me that. I find it odd that we talk. I mean, ethics is based on the fact the whole science, the whole the whole, the whole philosophy uh, area of philosophy is based on the idea that that beings have interests, and when interests are adversely affected, we need to think about we need to think about the adverse effecting. If there was no such thing as the adverse effecting of interest, we wouldn't be talking about ethics. The only reason why we talk about ethics is the adverse is the is is, is, is the adverse effect um, on interest. And so um, to say, well. You know, gee, we're moral philosophers, but is there a moral, you know, is there a moral reality? The answer is, look, I, you know, I'm not saying it's a simple question, but I do think that the idea that 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 adversely affecting interest requires some sort of moral justification is something that most people um, understand to be true in the same way that I say this class exists is true. I mean, if you're going to be skeptical about my proposition about that. Why are you skeptical about this? Because you might be a brain in a jar that some. I mean, you know, you know, you can't cabin in skepticism in that way and just sort of sort of apply it to moral to moral issues, but not to other issues. And so it seems to me that you know when you when you go to harm somebody and they say no, I you know people people respond. They say no, you shouldn't do that. That is wrong. They're not just saying don't do it. I don't like it. They're saying it's unjust. You, I don't deserve what you're doing. To so I honestly think that this is something, and it's cross-cultural. I mean, it's like basically wherever you look, uh, wherever you see sentient humans, you see some manifestation of this idea. And so, you know, I'm saying that if that's the only idea we've got, that's fine. And I'm happy to say the burden ought to be on anybody who wants to adversely affect those interests to justify adversely affecting those interests. And I think we would end up with a very different situation than a situation where we have the burden of showing that they're, quote, persons or whatever the hell that means. 
Anyway, thank you very much. And I just want to make one point to congratulate Bucknell because do you realize, Gary, we got through this session without being asked a fun question? That's only because there are other people with their hands up. And, and, okay. and, it's, and, and it's great. Uh, and th Gary, thank you so much for this conference. So for the live stream, we'll be back at 1, right? Yeah, we're live streaming this on, on my Facebook page. And we'll be back at 1. Yeah. Yeah, see you at 1. Thank you. Thank you. I, can I just tell her I love her before you get rid of her? I love you. I love so Lord should be here now. We've got until about one o'clock, okay? And we're just going to eat. Where's your hand?